if you wanted to save the planet, particularly the wildlife world, how would you best go about it? Now, there are concerns that many images that seek to do that are failing to achieve the desire that is so desired change that is so desperately needed. These images are often romanticized, animals roaming free and wild, but in a distant, non-human world that may unwittingly actually serve to only separate us from nature. The eminent biologist, Dr. George Schala, said you can do the best science in the world, but unless emotion is involved, it's not very relevant. I am an animal photographer rather than a wildlife photographer. My interest lies in the way we shape our relationship to animals, their meaning, and the role that imagery plays in influencing our emotional connection with them. I have a passion for how we transform images into meaning. Today, I want to share some images from my recent project, Endangered, where I journeyed thousands of miles to seek out animals that were on the edge of extinction. But before I do that, I wanted to share some more recent work of mine, non-endangered animals, and how these images operate on our imagination. For example, you're here looking at an abstract image of a horse, and you glance to the mane, and it drifts you to other associations, such as maybe a winter holiday, or the weather outside this building at this moment. The white dove, the symbol of purity, spirituality, love. But the pigeons, I don't know if it's too cold for them out at the moment, but the pigeons outside are exactly genetically the same, rock doves. So how is it where you go from, some people describe pigeons as flying rats, and then contrast that the Holy Spirit? How can color have such a huge influence? But what I want to explore is how cultural meaning affects the way we interpret the content or the species in this case. So, good bat, bad bat. Dracula, the blood-sucking thing, versus Batman, the hero, who puts fear into, of God into the criminal world in the guise of a bat. Now, what's interesting is did you realize the picture was upside down? You're entertaining this guy because the eyes are above the feet. We naturally are creatures of habit. And I want to explore how cultural meaning often trumps the very nature of the subject we deal with. Now, I guess you're wondering, did he pluck the chicken? <laughs> I think you'll be assured I didn't. In fact, it's a naturally occurring mutant. But it's really interesting because we're looking at this sort of bird prancing across the stage like a plump ballerina. I can't do point, but... And here it is gazing back at us, which is a bit kind of weird. And what I was going to say is you're more likely to meet this bird bald, featherless, and headless in Tesco's or Sainsbury's or your local supermarket. We are, in a sense, the way we know animals today has profoundly changed. I think it's that we have never been more separated from nature than we are right now. Digital's changed everything, and many of us spend at least seven and a half hours online daily. Does this mean that we have got to re-evaluate and question how can imagery actually reconnect us with nature? This is a Hungarian pulley. I call it flying mop. <laughs> He's actually mid-jump, and on this one, <laughs> I, I did think of putting a handle just there, but I wasn't tempted. This panda I, I met at the, the Chengdu Research Center in, in China, and I had her den, and I asked the keeper, would you get her out, ask her to go over there? So a few bamboo shoots outside her enclosure, I dressed it with a piece of dress velvet, perfect dress velvet. I bought all the way over from England. 
and I put it to the rear of her cage, and then effectively when she marked back, when she came in from outside into the enclosure, guess what she does? She goes up, she pulls it down, she comes over right up to us where we are and goes, and she just tears it in half. And I'm going, oh no. My wife, who's sitting in the audience, here goes, oh no. In fact, I think she was louder than me. And, and in, the, in the end, we got there. Now, I'm also wearing a onesie taking this picture. You're probably wondering, am I trying to pass myself off as a panda? No. This is the first stage of a reintroduction program. And the panda has been bred captively, but we don't want to imprint human form. So the idea is they dress up looking like silly pandas. So hopefully, when our animal's in the wild, it doesn't see the first human and go, food. Vulnerability, personality. I want to explore these as important mechanisms to connect us with nature. You know, cuteness. A lot of indications are, with neuroscientists, that Actually, it's like a neural highway. It works so fast that we react to that before rational thought. Scientists are, who I've spoken to, neuroscientists, have specifically said that a lot of what we do is we act emotionally before we have rational thought. So this is why these tools are so important. These frog eggs, which I brought you right in, so you can see almost the eyes and the arms. What is curious is, when I phoned up the scientists and said, can I come up to photograph them? These are, by the way, from Costa Rica, but he's breeding them here in the UK. He said, come up on a Thursday. I said, thinking I'd have to count the week to get the best moment. That's day five of gestation. He said, day four, they have no eyes. Day five, they'll be perfect. Day six, they'll be too dark for photography. So he was able to regulate the temperature. This is exactly why the amphibians are being decimated, or in fact, there's a mass extinction going on, because climate change is ultimately affecting the, that group and decimating it. It's, it's, um, so the temperature is so vital. I put this in because this is actually dad. So you're looking at the rarest tortoise in the world, from Madagascar. But what's really sad is that they're having, the conservationists are having to engrave and deface these animals uh, to put them in the wild to try to discourage people, poachers, from taking them out of the wild. So something that is prized in the black market as a, in the pet trade is exactly why they're having to Make it less beautiful. I always like to show the character in my work. This is the nursery, which is where they have about 100 at the nursery, and I think there's 100 in the wild at the moment. But a couple of years ago, they broke into the nursery, and they caught the poachers or the traffickers at the airport with a suitcase containing over 10% of the entire population of the species. Now, they have since posted armed bodyguards around the center, which is what you're looking at here. This model also has his own bodyguard, as you can imagine. I was looking in the eye of this, the last male northern white rhino, and questioned to myself, what does it say about us? Now, I read the news yesterday, and I don't if anyone else picked it up. It said that Sudan is the name of this rhino. Apparently, he's on death watch, and he's probably going to pass away in the next few days. Now, this is a lowland western gorilla in Gabon. Now, I actually, he's been reintroduced into the wild. I met him 10 years earlier at Portland, Kent. And so, if you look at this picture, you can sense that connection with us, that, that sort of the drinking. And I would say that this picture is more emotionally engaging, and you're more likely to connect to the story about him than perhaps the previous shot. So ha here we have a crown shafaka, which is a lemur from Madagascar. 
But he's occupying the body language of a child at a school assembly. <laughs> and that vulnerability reminds me of a very tragic picture of a three-year-old Syrian refugee boy that, that died off the Mediterranean. And you have a paramilitary policeman holding this child. The predominant thing you see is the shoes. They're Velcro shoes. Now, any parent can think of just what it feels like to put those shoes on your child. That one picture was to change the course of attitudes in governments, particularly in Europe, towards the refugees and allowing them greater numbers to enter the, into our country and Germany. Again, I'm looking at this point of connection. It's so important, in a sense, for us to know what emotional connection helps support us in storytelling. Now, Linda, Professor Linda Kaloff at Michigan University, the sociologist, has been doing studies into what type of image actually truly connects us in a way that will make us value. If you do a style of representation culturally associated with human representation, with animals, we are powerfully more connected. You've brought that otherness into our world and that sameness. This sense of bringing not the otherness but sameness is so important, connecting them from us, in a, us in a sense, bringing them into our world. You know, even with a portrait of a hippo, I have to be right in there across. I want you to feel that you understand this personality. This brings me to this debate. How do we, once we've, in a sense, connected in the storytelling, how do we take that storytelling to the bigger issues, like habitat destruction, climate change? How do we connect us emotionally in this hostile world? This is the polar bears that I photographed in, the, in Canada at the Hudson, Hudson Bay. But there you get it, you get right in there. The compellingness of the unfamiliar. It's actually a saiga, which I photographed near the Caspian Sea in Russia. But this picture went viral on my Instagram because it's strange and unfamiliar. I suspect most of you don't know what this species is. It's a, <laughs> it's a pie tamarind from Brazil. And actually, its habitat's been concreted out at the moment uh, because the capital of the Amazon is Manos. It's one of the most endangered primates in the world. But if I said Yoda, <laughs> there you go. Then you know instantly, isn't it crazy, that the animal that inspired Yoda could disappear in a, to oblivion or off the edge, and be, edge of extinction, and we wouldn't know about it. Avatar, life of Pi. These cultural metaphors are so powerful that you instantly gauge, connect, that the cultural meaning of these dancing fireflies from Japan are part, by fluorescence, is a metaphor that's commonly used. If I said sea angels rather than sea slugs of Japan, the stars, the celestial stars, almost, how can I say, they, um, they're plankton. Extreme cosmetic surgery. <laughs> the Yunnan sub monkey from China, up on the Tibetan plateau, one of the most thought extinct and then rediscovered in 1962. These crown cranes, red crown cranes from Japan, they're the symbol of luck, fidelity, and long life. They're such a powerful symbol, yet, they're hunted for their plumage and habitat loss meant that they almost became extinct in 1920 when there was only 30 left, less than the number in this picture that you see here. The icons of death, the vultures, they are essentially, in reality, they're nature's cleaners. And as a result of their demise in Africa and India, particularly India, you have outbreaks of rabies as a consequence of the feral dogs filling that gap. The largest wingspan 
the Philippine eagle, critically endangered, now the national bird, declared the national bird. Personality, character, the shoe bill from East Africa. I'm saying it's about connecting, and this is the power. So here you are looking into another simian sentient being. It's the Celise crested macaque. I wanted to explore how important truly valuing something, and I believe through emotion we truly can value, where we're moved. If we truly connect emotionally, we can and value these animals, we can bring them back from the edge of extinction. It's never been more important to connect people with nature. Our future depends on it. Thank you.